So, my name is uh, Wolfgang Heinz Halprep, and I was born in Berlin, Germany, to a Jewish father, a Christian mother, and my, they were not married, and uh, it was 1931. So, <clears throat> in 1933, we know that uh, a man by the name of Adolf Hitler became elected by the German people to be premier of Germany. So actually, my my life actually started in 1933 because my father was a very strict Jew, and he had me was as I was born. He had me registered in a Jewish community center in Berlin, and he also had my birth. You know, so uh, uh, he wanted to really have me to be Jewish. Yeah, my father was uh, strict, and uh, because he was born in, in Poland to Jewish family, of course, and uh, so he insisted that I should be raised as a Jew. You know, so my mother agreed to that, and uh, so it was not 1933, and the, the Nuremberg laws in Germany started to come out. And uh, among these laws, of course, was the discrimination against Jewish and so forth. Although my father was still insisting because he served in the German army in World War I. So he figured that no, nobody is going to touch him, you know. And uh, so he was also running a respectable business in Berlin. He was in janitorial supplies and he had a big warehouse. And he was working as a sales, sales, sales merchandise and so forth. So he was really well off, you know, and he was sure that there's not going to be any problems, even if Hitler was elected, you know. So here we go, over 1933, and so I started to grow up. And uh, my mother, well, I mostly lived with my mother, though, because my father had another family, see. So he just came a lot of times to visit us. And, you know, he was there a lot of times. In fact, he was thinking of divorcing his wife, you know, because uh, he loved my mother very much. Anyway, we had a little apartment in the middle of Berlin, not too far from the Olympic Stadium in Berlin, which they had the, the games in 1933. And um, in which the Germans started to show their super superiority in those games, you know. But it didn't work out for Hitler at that time, you know, but he was just a... Anyway, my father also was dibbling in boxing. He was kind of an amateur boxer, you know. So in, in the foreign office, well, it was not professional, but he was very good in traveling from town to town and take some matches and usually took me with him, you know. And he got to know uh, the big boxer at that time, Max Schmeling, you know, he used to be a big uh, boxer in, in Germany. And uh, so at one time he even brought me over to see him, you know. And Max Schmeling was a very, uh, he, he never got into that Nazism in, uh, in Germany, you know, which started, people started getting uh, all worked up about it, you know, the, the Hitler started, then the Hitler youth, you know, where they had these shiny little uniforms, you know. So as I was growing up, I was looking at that and I figured, maybe why can't I get into one of those uniforms, you know. It looks so brilliant, you know, with medals and stuff. So, you, you know, you're four or five years old. You really don't know here or there, but since that was not a, the theme in, in in Berlin, especially, you know, all the flags and banners and, 
you know, Hitler's speeches and the brown shirts marching around, you know. It just the impressions were just too great sometimes, you know. And so I didn't really realize yet what what's going on, you know. All that was just the parades and stuff was great for me, you know, five years old. So anyway, uh, with six years old, uh, my mother put me in a school, elementary. No, she was not aware either that Jews cannot even go to schools, you know. But the Nuremberg laws were not that enforced yet, you know. They were there, but it's it's not that strict yet. But anyway, so I, was, I attended first class, got into second class, then came the, the hammer, you know, the teacher one day had a list, you know, and uh, was sitting there, and, and she says, according to our laws, our, our leaders, Adolf Hitler and our superiority, all Jews have to be removed from school right now. And we have one Jew here, and she called my name, you know. And, of course, I was crying, and the other kids would start yelling and screaming at me, you know, dirty Jew. And it was just hurtful of that experience, you know. I was six, seven years old and uh, feeling it, you know. So, so that was the first encounter that I had with that kind of regime, you know, that took over in, uh, in Germany. So I, I got just to just leave the school right now. And so I ran out uh, crying and some kids came after me and trying trying some stones and stuck, you know, spitting. And now with some of these kids were in the Hitler Youth, you know, so I, I was running from them, really. So now I knew I got to my mother's and start crying and telling her, you know, what happened to me in school. And she says, oh, no, don't worry, I'm going to go with to the talk to the principal there. And, and she was she was trying to, to get me back in the school there. So she actually went the next day to the principal's office and argued with him, you know. And he says, you know, we have, Irvok, we have proof that he has uh, been circumcised and he's in the a Jewish community center. His name is in there. He's a full Jew. And she, he says, if you want to pick that up, you have to go to Gestapo and have them reverse the decision or something, you know. And uh, well, she says, she's going to do that too, you know. So she, listen, my mother was not very big, you know, but... She went into Gestapo headquarters in yeah, in the and the, and the, and the, and the, those big guys, you know, and all this thing. And she tried to argue with them, you know, that her, her son is not Jewish and that the circumcision was just medically, and she's gonna bring a receipt that, that the doctors will testify to that. And they told her, well. We have that he is Jew, and uh, you should be happy that we didn't even take him yet. You know, you can keep you can keep him at your home, but we don't want him anymore in public places. And you just if it's good for you, just keep him away. You know, because he got Jewish blood, and Jewish blood is, in our our opinion, evil and bad. So don't don't ever. Come again, you know. So she took me home. But at that time, we we couldn't even keep the apartment. You know, the the landlord told us to we have to move. You know, so we finally we finally found another place. But that was a lady with her sister that has an apartment, and she says we can have one room. You know, one room in the in her apartment, but. Uh, I should stay in the room all day long, you know, I should not uh, uh, only go to the toilet or something, but not uh, get out too much, you know. Uh, well, I have to do that. In the meantime, my father, his family, they, they 
pushed him saying, you can't stay in, in Germany anymore. And, uh, you know, you, you might be thinking that because you all an involved, they, they can't uh, touch you. Uh, uh, it should be good for you to leave Germany, you know, but he can't take you. So anyway, he was weighing his uh, options, you know, what, what to do. But he kept on visiting us anyway, you know, all the time. As years go by, so 1960, 19, I mean, 1936, 1937, and so on. And uh, so from finally, my I got very sick. I won, one time I got very sick when I was about eight years old. I had diphtheria, and my mother had to take me. In fact, I was so sick, of my, my fever was so high that I was already hallucinating, you know. And so she took me. There was no other transportation. She had to take me in a streetcar to the nearest hospital. It just so happened there was a Nazi hospital. You know, they, they were strictly by Hitler's rules. But she got me there, and they took me in because I was so sick, in, uh, and I had to be there. And, and the, the thing was, in the Nazi hospital, even if you were that sick, in the mornings when the nurses came in and so on, you had to get out of bed and Heil Hitler, everybody, all the kids there, they had to scream, Heil Hitler. And uh, it was just terrible for me. So then my mother came to visit me, and she said, uh, well, your father, he decided he, he will leave Germany, you know. Before he left Germany, the Kristallnacht came around, you know, and she told me, don't go out in the streets, please, don't. Don't go any place right now. All the, the hooligans, all the, the looters and stuff, is they, they roaming to the streets and carrying those flags and you know brown shirts. They pushing people and the, the common people were, you know, all screaming in the streets. The Heil Hitler and stones were thrown around and glass was shattering in Jewish stores. They came even to my uh, father's, um, he had a storeroom, a big storeroom in it, and they smashed everything there. He just wiped it completely out, you know. And even then after that, the police came around, the German Berlin police and stuff. They told him, well, Jew, you have to pay for that damage, you know. It, 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 you can't just, do so he said, but I, they smashed my place. He says, that's never you pay for it. And so did a lot of other Jewish people in Berlin. You know, they went into the synagogues, you know, took tours, told them on the street. And then he even started fires, you know, in the streets, which was not very happy for the German, for the Berlin fire brigade. They had to put all these fires out, you know. They had to work over time to get these fires out because it was just a grim picture of Berlin. I mean, you never have seen people like that worked up and... Could you see it out your window? Could you see any? I could see some of that, yes. You know, I got very... I was so scared. I, I knew by now that they were persecuting me too, you know, so I, I'm the one that, you know... And, but these two sisters that were running the apartment... They said, don't worry, don't worry, Kid, stay there, stay there, stay there. And so I, I did uh, stay with my mother too, you know, she was, she was worried, you know, because at that time too, the Gestapo told her that I have to wear the uh, Star David on, on the outer garments, you know. If I don't wear that, they really take me away immediately, you know. So I had that star on my, my garment all the time, see, and it says Judy, you know, Jewish. And um, now anyway, so that Kristallnacht, for, after that, every Jew in Germany knew what's coming. So my father was now lucky enough, right after that, he got into a 
a ship or plane or whatever with his family and he went to Shanghai, uh, China, you know. Yeah, there was the only place that actually were welcoming Jews. I mean, without every country in the world was kind of uh, hesitant to to take all these refugees at the time, you know, especially Jewish refugees, I guess. So, but he was to get there to Shanghai, and uh, there's no, but now I was left behind, you know. I never saw my father again, no. He was, he, he, you know, so I grew up now with just my mother. The year came around 1939, the war started, you know, the German troops. And uh, people were all enthused about all the victories that the German army was going on, you know. And uh, we were still living in that apartment. And, uh, of course, my like groceries and things like that, for Jews, they had special coupons and stuff, you know, like I had only, but, but my mother had her full portion. But... Most of the time, I stayed in one room, you know. See, I've started, since I had nothing to, to ed be educated, I started reading books, little books, you know, and things like that, so that I can start learning how to read and how to write. You know, I taught myself. I was just there in this room and staying all day. That was my life, you know. And... Uh, as now came around 19, 1941, yeah, the Gestapo came to all of a sudden. They cleaned up everywhere. Jews were now deported. You know, German Jews were all deported, to put into cattle cars and got away. So my name came up with them too, you know. So they came to the, the house and they told my mother, I said, if we're taking him, but we're not taking him to a camp. He's going to go into an orphanage. There was a Jewish orphanage in Berlin that was established in 1888 where Jewish kids were, you know, were housed. And the ages in, the, in that uh, orphanage was from two years to 18 years old kids, you know. They took me over there with you know, and there was, uh, that was now my place to, and there were, the rumor was that eventually they're going to ship these, ship us somewhere into camps maybe, you know. Uh, anyway, our days were just, they could not teach, the teachers could not teach because the used children were not supposed to be educated. So all we could do all day long is just play or, or do some hobbies, you know. And, um, well, we made, I made friends with kids my age in that orphanage. The terrible thing was that a lot of those Jewish teachers, they, they started cooperating with the Nazis, you know, because they wanted to save their own hide, you know. So especially one teacher was very bad. His name was Abramovich, and uh, he was a very bad apple there, you know. He was beating up and hitting people, you know, and pushing us around. And the food was horrible, you know. We just got rations by the Nazis, what they gave to the orphanage, what they allowed, you know. And so um, most of the time we're trying to hide from the, from the teachers sometimes, you know. So we hide in the bathroom or something like that. You know, that that's, was about the day, you know, that we spent in that orphanage, you know. It was just a horrible experience there, too. My mother was allowed to visit me about once a month. All relatives was allowed to visit only, you know, that for once a month. And uh, now this, the 1942, 43, the Nazis started deporting our kids, too. So what they did, they came in the middle of the night. They usually it came, and they hit the list, you know, of the kids that they're gonna take. And Abramovich, of course, he had a big whip, you know, 
He liked that, yeah. So anytime they called a, a kid's name in a bit, he whipped that over to that kid, you know, to get up and, you know, get ready. And of course, you sitting, I mean, I'm here, I was nine, 10 years old. I was shivering in my bed thinking, I hope they don't call my name, you know. Everybody was kind of shivering and worrying, you know, that they don't call the, the name. And so it didn't, you know, for a, long, a few times, but every, almost every night they came, you know, they just stopped over the list and just took more and more kids away, you know. And uh, we always had the picture, yeah, we know where they're going, you know, because we, they were the tallest, of our was too tallest, he says. Well, there are camps where you're going to go to, you know. And uh, they, they, they'll be treating you okay, you know. Uh, anyway, so they didn't take us. So it came 1943. One day they did not see, decided they're going to dissolve the whole orphanage, you know. So SS came in, you know, the high blues came into the orphanage, and uh, they started taking the little kids, you know. One of my, my tasks was in, in the orphanage sometimes, babysitting on these little kids, you know, because I was a little bigger already than the little ones, you know, they were. And so I had some some babies that I liked very much already, you know. And so when they came, they started crying and screaming. And so so they took a machine gun and started to shoot. They just wiped them out. They still have a wall with all the kids' names on. You know, they just killed them right there. And they finished the screaming and the screeching and the, you know, and the rest of us, they took it into trucks, you know. And there was a big assembly point in Berlin. There was hundreds of people, maybe even thousand people were really there waiting for deportation. The cattle, the uh, vehicles, the trains, they were already ready there to push them in and take them to camps, you know. And... Here was with two other guys, you know, who we survived. Like, and I'm looking, and he, the other guy says too, you know, he's looking. There's a little wall there, not too high, you know. He, he, he you think we can get over that? And the other guy, we said, well, it's just, I don't know, but the SS is looking everywhere. I said, well, what can, what can I say? Let's start. And we run through that wall, get over it, and we're gone, you know. But at the time, I, I start looking back. I saw one SS soldier. He saw us. He didn't shoot. You know, he did not shoot. So we got over that wall and back in the streets, you know. And uh, of course, I couldn't run to my mother's place because I knew if I run there, that's where they're going to look first, you know. On the other hand, she had uh, uh, brothers and sisters living in Berlin too. So I knew one uncle, he had a little spread outside of Berlin, a little uh, cottage and some big backyard and things. So I thought that's the be the place that I go first, you know. So... Uh, I took off and, and, oh, it was a long way to go there. You know, I couldn't take any transportation or anything. You know, I just, in the meantime, I also kept my star on here, you know, because I figured if a policeman see, you know, maybe I, that, I'd be in bigger trouble, you know, like that. So I finally made it to uh, my uncle, but he had two girls, his kids, one one uh, one girl, a cousin of mine, you know, she was already 14, 15 years old, and she was also in the Hitler Youth, you know. But my uncle was very strict. He was he was against that Nazi regime and against. So he told them, "You're not going to tell anybody that you have your cousin over here now." You know, 
And he told me he had a little water hole there in the backyard. He says, you're going to hide in there during the daytime, especially because the neighbors, otherwise, they're going to be thinking, what is a kid running around in daytime, not in school? So they might just, you know, say something. But he was very, I mean, I really loved that uncle. My uncle Max was his name. And, um, well, he had a big habit. He, he was drinking a lot, you know. But he was very glad. That, I was very glad that he took me in for, he says, for a little while, you know, until somebody will get suspicious or something. So then you may have to go to another place and hide there. So I was hiding there now. In the meantime, the uh, the bombing started. You know, the Allies started to bomb Berlin. And uh, and I couldn't even go in, in anywhere else in, in a shelter or anything like that, you know, because uh, they, with my star on them, the Jew. Anyway, uh, we had this bombing, and one, one day... Uh, Bomb fell not far from that. I mean, it was really scary, you know. And so my uncle, he says, you know, it's better you you, you can't stay no more. You know, it's, it's too dangerous for you to stay. So I did go back to see my mother, you know. Well, I was in touch with her. She came to see me all the time there too, you know. She was working in the meantime as a telephone operator in the, telef in the telephone uh, central you know, and she she knew a lot about what's going on for people who go to camps and, you know, the cattle cars that were loading up uh, in Berlin, you know, to bring them to, to, to camps. And so now I left that uncle uh, place, and she says, you know, I have some friends that they might not know. The men, the... Um, friend of mine, he is was a communist. He hated the Hitler regime, so he might be willing to hide you there. So I went there, and see, then they said, okay. And they had two boys, too, that were almost ready to go in the German army, you know, 14, 16, you know. But still, they, you know, they didn't say nothing. They kept me. We, we actually f became friends like, you know. So I stayed there for almost four or five months, you know. And finally, the bombing was so bad, you know, that uh, they said, you can't stay here no more either. So now I was almost like on the street. You know, I didn't have any place more to go. So any time the bomb was I couldn't go in the shelters and stuff. So I was just hiding and... Places were the smashed from the bombings, you know. So I was hiding there, like being homeless, you know. And but my, of course, my mother was always trying to keep track of me, and she bought me food and things like that, you know. And she says, no matter what, now Berlin is bombed. You come to my place now, and you stay with me. Whatever happens, we're gonna go through this together. So she took me there, and. He, Again, it was that little room that I had to stay, you know. And But now the bombing was day and night, you know. The Americans were bombing at night. The English were bombing at daytime. And I saw all those houses around me smashed too, you know, going into wounds. And I watched all that through the window that I had. But in the meantime, the, the German people started a little getting a little bit uh, disillusioned with all that stuff that they start losing now, you know, instead of winning. So the newspaper was already uh, sometimes, you know. But Hitler was always giving those big speeches and screaming in the Hitler and the radios, you know. We knew that the Russians are advancing in the East, you know, because we did read the newspapers, but they still encouraged the German people to be, we were going to be the winners because, you know, they thought that they can hold it up and and come up with some terrible weapons that they can 
Well, you know, they had almost invented the atomic bomb, you know, in, the, in the Germany. They, that's Ronald von Braun and uh, the scientists, the German scientists, they were already inventing these rockets that they could shoot. They were bombing England. And so they always gave the German people hope. We'll, once we get that, we're going to be the winners, you know, we're going to smash the rest of the world, you know. And uh, by that time now, I was already uh, 24, 11, 12 years old. And finally, the Russians came to Berlin, you know. And uh, I was hiding in, in a basement of my uncle's uncle's house now, you know. And we, it, it was fighting all around. Those two boys that I talked about, they all of a sudden became patriots and they, they wanted to shoot the Russians, you know. So they got killed. You know. Both of them got killed. And uh, well, yeah, now I now remember. And anyway, so I was in the, in the cellar, cellar with the other people and then we saw a Russian tank came down the street slowly coming, you know. So they told me, go out there, go out there. So I did, I ran out the cell, they went there, and it was a Russian lieutenant or something. And he saw my star, and so he kept screaming, Hitler's dead, Hitler top, Hitler dead. And he braced me, and that was my liberation there, just 1945. And it was human domain. And uh, so now Berlin was liberated. And But believe it or not, they were still, before the Russians really took all of Berlin, they were still deporting Jews. They were still doing it. In fact, when we visited Berlin later in on the years, they showed me that they, even in the suburbs of Berlin, they had these still cattle cars, and right in underneath, people who lived in these houses, they saw all that, you know, never did anything. You know, the, the German population was just simply, they were hypnotized or something, you know, but there was not much resistance anywhere, you know. They almost to the last second or last minute, they were still they, uh, laugh at Hitler or something, you know. Hitler and his regime, yeah. Anyway, so now the Russian liberated us, and um, but by the time now that I we got to get uh, to my de next de destination, let's say, we still had to live in Berlin, you know. But uh, in the meantime, the, the punished the, the Russian punished Berlin in general, you know. The, they didn't give any more, uh, there were no provisions, no food, no nothing. We had to stand in long lines to, you know, sometimes we had to even stand in line for for meat. They had for horse meat, you know, for sale. The hours and hours you had to stand in lines. And they, even one time I went out to the country, my mother said, maybe bring some food back. But not, I was already 12, 13 years old, so... The trains were overcrowded to go out from Berlin, and uh, I went. I went out to a little farm way out Berlin. The farmer he says, "Okay," he says, "You work here for fourteen days, and you can take anything you want. You know, you can take bacon, chicken, can all put in your backpack and take it back to Berlin." So I agreed. You know, I stopped work for him. 14 days there, and then I had to walk with my backpack on, the, and here comes a, a Russian truck, you know, with some Russian, young Russian soldiers, and they had fun with just taking my, my backpack, and I told them, I'm Jewish, Jew, didn't care. He just smashed all up what I was working for. <laughs> so, if you come back to Berlin, I said, oh, no. And I, I saw a field with potatoes, you know, that, so I said, well, if the dark comes, I grab some potatoes and stuff, you know, put in a backpack. So I did, so at least I came home 
you know, my mother and bring that. And she, in the meantime, she got a job in a Russian kitchen cooking for Russian soldiers, you know. So she was able to get good food sometimes, bring it home. You know, we were all eating a little bit from that, yeah. So we got all into buses, two buses, and but the, the mother said, my mother said, they told her that she can come later, but right now be just taking us to Palestine. And so we went into the trucks and stuff, you know, and start going. But then they, they divided Germany into zones, you know, there was the Russians, the Russian zone, and they were they were in Berlin and you had to leave the Russian zone, to get into the American zone, you know. And then they, in the Russians, when we left them at the buses, they said, oh, go to Moscow, go to Moscow. Well, we didn't. We kept on going into the American zone, finally. But in, in the meantime, also, my, my mother, before that, before I even got into those buses, before that, my mother decided to stay in the Russian zone in Berlin is not good, so let's try to at least get into the American zone of Berlin, you know. There was no wall yet, but you had to go into uh, the train to get into the Russian zone, and you couldn't get any package or any luggage because the, the Russians were patrolling the, the trains, you know, so... Actually, we got into the American zone. That's where my highest really picked me up because we went into a settlement there in Stuttgart, Germany. And so that's where they picked me up and we got into the trains and they go to, to France first. So we got to Paris and from Paris we traveled all the way down to Marseille. In the meantime, I learned to speak French pretty good, you know. I was talking perfectly French. And because a long, a long time went by, about five, six months before we even, they said a ship, they're going to take us to uh, Palestine. And, um, and finally the ship came along in Marseille, and we boarded the ship. And they told us, too, you know, that we're going to hide some young people, young men. You're going to hide them because in Palestine, we're going to need those young people. We got, we got conflicts and problems over there, too. So I said, okay. We got in there, and I had one young man that was hiding with me, you know, in the ship. And so we traveled, came to Haifa, Palestine. And the English came aboard, you know, the English. Well, the second Nazis, you know, all of a sudden they they came with weapons and everything looking for illegals, you know. And they find that young man, they found some of these young men, they took him away, you know. And here we are, they took him to Cyprus or something where they established some camps for illegals that are trying to sneak into Israel or to Palestine. And, but we we were the first Jewish children transport from Europe to Palestine, so they they had big they had a big welcome for us, you know. We, we came from the war zone now to Palestine, and it took us to Tel Aviv, and in Tel Aviv we uh, there was a special. It was kind of a farm, like you know, they turn they give you agricultural training and catch up with your education. By that time, I was fourteen years old, didn't have much education at all, so we had to learn, of course, new language, Hebrew, and go to school. You know, third to fourth class, fifth stage, we had to catch up. See. So we did all, we, we enjoyed, I enjoyed my stay there, and they call it the Hanachichi 
cheese shake house. It was, yeah, it was kind of a really good experience, you know, free compared to, to the orphanage that I was in Berlin. It was heaven, you know. Although the, the British, they were really, sometimes really get nasty around, you know. They, they have had curfews in, in Tel Aviv, and the bubonic plague came along, you know, in uh, Tel Aviv. And this bubonic plague was so bad that when people were walking on the street and just wobbling a little, the English were shooting them, you know. Yeah, they had to. They were boarding up houses and things, you know, because it was that contagious. But they they were they were doing, they almost enjoyed that, you know. But so what was I'm saying that we had a good time in 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 a uh, in that uh, facility there, you know. My mother, in the meantime, she did come to the United States. Out to the excuse me, came to Palestine. And um, we settled into a, into a kibbutz. They call kibbutz a chiller. That's not too far from Tel Aviv. And these were mostly German Jews that settled that kibbutz, you know. So we, went, we settled in there. And because they were speaking German, but my mother could not speak uh, Hebrew or anything, you know. So she was just there. She was very kind of strange, you know, but anyway, they were her and everything, but they never, at that time, they didn't want to speak German with her. They hated the German language, and she had to start learning Hebrew, you know, I tried to give her you know, hints. And uh, so we lived, I lived there till 1948, but finally they decided to is. Uh, Palestine become Israel, you know. The United Nations voted. We were we were listening to the radio for each country that voted for or against the state of Israel, you know. Every vote was for uh, become a state, you know. And um, then finally it passed and the United Nations, you know, the, they come endorsed uh, the establishment of a Jewish state in Israel, you know, call it Israel. And uh, so we were very happy with that, you know. But before that, that right after that, my mother decided we can't stay here in the kibbutz. I'm going to try to find some job, some work in, in Tel Aviv, and we maybe rent an apartment there. And so I did, we did move to, back to Tel Aviv. And um, she found a job as, she was a nurse, really, a, a, a baby nurse. She found some job to a family then, you know. And um, so we lived, uh, we had a little, again, a little apartment that we found, actually an old Arab uh, place. And I got a job with the um, a British company, the refrigeration, you know, so I worked a little bit. And I found a good friend of mine, and his name was Peter Bergman. He used was with me in in uh, in Israel, you know. I mean, he was in Israel with me all the time too, you know. And his name is. They made actually they changed my name to Moshe. Uh, my name became Zeif, Zeif Halpap, and his name became Moshe Bergman. And we became very good friends. He he went into uh, watches, repair watches. I went into refrigeration and stuff. So when the forty eight war before it started, you know, so Moshe came to me and he says, you know, we have to. I was only now seventeen years old. He said we have to volunteer. You know, we have to fight for our country. I said, well, there's so many organizations, there was the the Haganah, there was the Swahit, and the Etzel. He said, what are we going to join with the Haganah? So we got into the Haganah, and he said, well, we're going to train, you know, you know, go into boot camp and uh, train. 
And in the meantime, seven Arab stations got, uh, nations got ready to, to attack Israel, you know, and they started to try to throw us in the ocean, you know. Well, all we had, when we were in boot camp there, all we had weapons, but for some ironic reason, we had German rifles. And they were old rifles, you know, that they confiscated in Czechoslovakia and took to the Jewish, well, Haganah, we were the Haganah. And uh, we had to shoot, learn to shoot, but aim a little bit to the side, you know, so that we hit the target. And so we were training there, and then all of a sudden there was an alarm they said that Arab troops are attacking, start attacking. It was Iraqi troops, you know. But fortunately enough, they weren't trained so well either, you know. Uh, we had to go into the ditches and stuff. Now we were just recruits. We were just... <laughs> and we had to get ready to fight them, you know. And a lot of them... Well, we were scared, you know, now we, a whole, they were screaming and hollering, you know, and they they in trying to get on us, and we were going to be, well, we're going to lose that or something. But then they, Palmach, the better equipped troops, Jewish equipped troops, they came and they started helping and fighting those, those Arabs and troops, you know. But that's the way I got into the war now, you know. And this, but then they transferred me and Moshe to Jerusalem. We were fighting the Transylvanians, and they were helped, and 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 they were armed by the English. They helped them. In fact, the English tried to help the Arabs instead of us. We didn't have any weapons. We didn't have any real tanks. Sometimes we had the props. We had to put up like a cannon or a tank, you know, as props, you know. And so we were in in uh, Jerusalem fighting the Arabs, uh, the Transylvania troops, and they were whipping us. And so we were actually running and fleeing, you know. But I did do, and also Moshe, we went into some of the synagogues, these ultra religious, they didn't want to leave the Torah, and we had to sometimes drag them out, you know. They come, they're not going to care about, you know, about your tour or anything. You got to leave. Let's go, you know, because the Arabs were very brutal, you know. When they took, sometimes they took prisoners, these prisoners, send them back, they gouged their ears, their eyes out. They came back to us, you know. They released them like with eyes gouged out. So this was just terrible. I mean, we started hating, really hating the Arabs in, in general and the British. You know, they they turned all their forts they had in in Israel. They turned them over to the Arabs. You know, and um, in here in the middle of fighting and everything, Ben Gurion, who was the leader for us, he came to visit. You know. And that's the picture that you seen. But I wasn't in the picture right next to him, but I was around there, you know. But he encouraged us and gave us good speeches and was, you know, to stand fast. And we, we were, for some reason, we were able to stand all these attacks, you know, even the Transjordanian, even that they start pushing us out of Jerusalem. You know, we were still fighting, you know, all young, we were all young boys, you know. That's, this one time, this one time, the, the time I was fleeing, we were fleeing over a field, you know, and Moshe and I, we were inseparable. He was just, and I got shot in the leg, you know, a sniper, a sniper shot me in the leg here, and I was just bleeding, and Moshe came, you know, to take me right away, Take me on him because I too much, started losing too much blood. And we got to the nearest uh, first aid and hospital mash, like, you know, there was already wounded soldiers, you know, so got shot in the breast and arms and stuff, you know. And so it was chaos, you know. And the doctor looked at my leg and he says, 
but it's too close to the bone and stuff. He says, amputate, cut it off. It's not time. So my, my friend Moshe, he took off his rifle, you know. He put it on the doctor's head, and he says, you take off his leg, I pull the trigger. So the doctor said, oh, put him over in the back, way in the back. Forget about it. You go next guy. <laughs> but that was just it, like that, you know. So they they never got him for that or anything. It's just that much chaos, that much confusion, you know, going on. And uh, they, they transported me to a hospital after that. Then they found out that I'm not of age. I was not 18 yet. See, they found out so. They actually said, you, we're going to have to discharge you from the Haganah, you know. But I was not at a hospital where all wounded soldiers were, you know. Some lost their arms, some lost their, lost their legs, you know. The doctors made rounds, but on my papers was that I lost my leg, you know. <laughs> so the doctor came around, he looked, and he says, uh, oh, we're going to fit you with a protease and stuff. Why is it? I took my leg. I have my leg. Oh, <laughs> she was surprised, you know, on that. Well, I said, no, anyway, I recuperated there. It was my leg was going okay. And, uh, well, anyway, they, they kind of discharged me, but they didn't discharge. They, they put me on the telephone operator. I became a telephone operator in the big camp. You Tel Aviv, and um, then finally they said, "Okay, you can go to the Negev and uh, watch some prisoners that were taken." You know, so I went down to the Negev, and on the Egyptian border they started taking prisoners, Arab uh, prisoners that they had. And one time I had a queue of prisoners going along, and I hear them speaking German. You know, I hear them speaking German. There's Arab prisoners here. Yeah. So I go next next to them and I spoke you know, in German. I said, you guys are fighting for the Arab armies, for the Egyptian armies? And they thought for some reason, because I speak such good German, that, you know, they can, I'm with them or something, you know. So they say, yeah, 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 we, we work volunteer to fight. And so... Then I went to my lieutenant, he says, they said, these are German soldiers. So they took them right away to the side, you know, to get them away from the other prisoners. They were not prisoners anymore, you know. So they were supposed to go to courts and get judged in courts and Jewish courts. Yeah, so then now finally the war was over and uh, we existed, we became Israel. And I knew that I did my my task, you know, for for my country. But I had to go back to work now and start my life, you know, because it's what I had to do now. So I started working as a technician in, in refrigeration, mostly, and worked in Tel Aviv. And my mother worked as a nurse. So we kind of built our life a little bit, but uh, kind of the years went by in Israel and it became more and more harder too, you know. The, the economy went up and our aim was always, well, at least my aim was, I wanted to go to America, you know, the United States. I was also looking if I could see anybody from my father's side, you know, because I know he had a family, really. You know, the former wife and the, the two children. And I was trying to find my step, my brothers, like, you know. Well, I knew that one one went to Argentina, one brother, one of the kids went to Argentina, and the other went here to America, you know. Yeah, I did hear from about my father that uh, he eventually died in the 50s. And uh, he died of a heart attack, but we don't know really. We really died off, you know. We know that the Japanese conquered uh, most of China, you know, and they were also shipping also Jews, you know. They dissolved the, the ghetto in Shanghai, 
and uh, we know that they were suffering the same almost like in Germany, you know. The Japanese were cooperating with the Nazis, you know. They knew that the Nazis wanted the Jews to be killed and whatever. And so that, that, that's all about mostly what I know about my father because, you know, I was too little really to be really bonded, you know, because I was only six, seven years old when he left. So I went again to the highest, you know, and seeing if they can, they couldn't get any visas to, we couldn't get any visas or anything to come to America. So my mother, he said, uh, they told us, if you go back to Germany as refugees, you might have a better chance to get visas to the America than from Israel, you know. <laughs> and so we decided we go back to Germany, you know. And, uh, but there was a strict law, not almost a law, that Jews cannot leave Israel to go to, uh, back to Germany. You know, so my mother was not Jewish, you know, so she, she did, they said, okay, she can have a visa to go to Germany, and since you, you're her kid, her son, we give you the visa, exit visa too, you know. So we went back to Germany, and we arrived in Germany, and, uh, Oh, I was starting to work there, you know, in Stuttgart, Germany. I so kind of settled there a little bit. And our aim was always to try to get a visa to the United States, you know, to apply to the American consul in Stuttgart, Germany, to get back to the United States. I finally, I went and tried to get hires, you know, and the hires is you have to go to the rabbis in the uh, in the Jewish community center in Stuttgart and to verify that you're really Jewish, you know. <laughs> yeah. I had all the, the, the pictures and the, the, the identity card and everything, I mean, that I suffered. And, but anyway, we went there, my mother and I, and the rabbi, he looked at me, he says, I know you and all of but we have to make sure that the Jews that you're a Jewish refugee. So I said, how? I said, well, let's go to the bathroom. So he came back and he says, yeah, he's circumcised. He's Jewish. So I finally got that visa to go to the United States. And my mother too, you know, we got it together. So we sailed all the way to New York, right? So the Statue of Liberty and blah, blah. I'm so happy that we got into American soil. When when they shipped me back as a soldier to to Germany, I was stationed in near New Frankfurt am I, and uh, we were a few Jewish soldiers together, and we 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 were very angry because anybody over thirty, man, they they might have been Nazis, you know, nineteen fifty six, fifty seven. We started a lot of fights, yeah. Sometimes we went into a place, you know, a restaurant or place, and we saw some guys that looked like over 30, and we started fighting with them. Yeah, stupid Nazis. And they, what was it? So the military police, many times they, they had to take us. Because, well, we were young too, you know. We, we did have resentment. We figured that they either was in the German army or was a Nazi or... Something, you know. Yeah, but you don't forget to, that the German people elected uh, Hitler, you know, to be their uh, leader, you know. So they, it was not only the, the the Jews that he started to, right, he was going after any any sub, 
human in his subhuman elements, you know, they were all supposed to be dead. You know, he didn't believe, he only believed in a very clean race, you know, and the Nazi philosophy was adjusted to that, you know. In my, in my family, they had, they were even going after people with handicaps and, uh, you know, backwards people. That, and we had one, one of the sisters, my my mother, she was a little, and she was afraid that they take her too, you know, because they were going after all every everything like that. I mean, Hitler killed seventeen million people, you know, the biggest catastrophe in, a, in a human history. I believe in God, yes. But I'm not a, I'm kind of an interfaith man, but I'm still, I do, yeah, in Yom Kippur, I don't want to go south, but it's Yom Kippur. And, but I believe in destiny and God. Some people I've interviewed have said, you know, I don't believe that there's a God who would like to. Well, in the concentration camps and things, yeah. I guess some some people, a lot of the Jewish people that had survived, but then they survived. They're the ones who should be grateful that they survived, you know. So maybe the ones that are dead before they were dead or before they got, they believe them. But I mean, the ones that have survived, especially in my group too, you know, I think they should be thankful because we're here. We're not dead. <laughs> So God was there probably. So that's that's the way I look at it. You know? Really. We were invited to Germany to get two weeks in Berlin with all the you know, hotel stay and meals and extra money to visits and things. So we learned a lot of things while we were there, you know, because we went to the archives. They took us to the Jewish archives where they kept all the papers. And it seems that the Nazis did have a lot of paper stuff on me, on me, you know. Yeah, I found out in these archives, they knew about me, they had that identity card and it was in the papers and I asked the clerk if I can take it and he says I don't know but I have to go to the bathroom now he said and I took it I I took it and he just closed his eyes <laughs> he let me have it <laughs> that identity card you know but I didn't have it before it was in the, in the archives see and they were all in papers about my father that, they were deported, and they knew about my uh, um, uh, circumcision in the in the Jewish community center, and they had it all on paper. The Nazis were very thorough with everything on paper, our catalog, and everything. So we went a lot of to the, also the Jewish museum. Then, of course, I went to the place, my orphanage. You know, what is the name of your orphanage? Auerbach. Auerbach Weissenhaus. And it, it's a family, a Jewish family, very prominent in Berlin, that established that uh, particular orphanage, like I said, 1888. And, um, well, it was not there anymore, you know, it was demolished because all Berlin was in ruins, you know, they erected Berlin. And, but there's is a, is a wall, you know, all the names of those little kids that they killed their, you know, their older names is on those wall. And the people who live there in this in the new building, they have to pass that wall all the time, you know. And it's, it's shown that that's where these kids got murdered, you know. And uh, I, like I said, I, I still get tears sometimes when I think about what happened. That was the worst bloodbath that I, I've seen in, in years, you know. I mean, it was just unimaginable. These kids screaming and they were just killing them, you know, and then taking them and throwing them in the trucks, you know, so get them away with them. 
things. It's just, it's just unbelievable that that happened, you know. And I, I told the you know, vice, vice uh, mayor of Berlin that he gave us a dinner party, like, you know, and I told him, I says, you know, what that experience is, is I never forget in my life. And he said, yeah, it's just horrible what you people had to go through, you know. message do you hope people kind of take away from your story? Do you hope they don't think about it from it? Well, to remember us, you know, because we're going to die out now. We're getting into ages that we pass away, and we should convey that message to the young people that they can, that they remember what, what happened in the Holocaust so they know what happens there in that, in that period, you know that this was never, even in any old times and old, they never, did that kind of a massacre, you know, for a specific race to be wiped out. That's what my message would be, and is, you know, in all the directions I have with the high schools that I make presentations or support, I always emphasize that, that the younger generation should be, you know, I have a granddaughter that she really is into it too, you know, and I hope she carries it on. My son's not so much now. <laughs> yeah, yeah my, my oldest son is now 62, and uh, he he knows that I was a Holocaust or so, but he's not very active, I have to say. Did you talk about your experiences when you were younger? Yes. Of course, I've always, always talked about it in Germany too. You know, I give story to the for me with Dan two sixteen. I I told my story there. They knew my story. I, they took me to the Jewish Museum. I have to say that in Berlin they're doing a lot for the population of Jewish uh, surviving and stuff. They have a lot of Jewish museums. And they have a big square where they, where they kind of imitate the camp, you know, Auschwitz, they commentated, you know, and then they have the place where Hitler died in a bunker. They have a little plaque there, you know. She told us, our guide, she told us, she says, we don't want to make a big thing like that. People would accumulate. No, it's just a little plaque that says, this is the bunker that Hitler died. Yes. Do you think there's a danger that we can repeat this kind of history? I don't think so. I don't think so. I I think there's always been anti-Semitism in the world, and there are some people that just you know crazy enough to. But I I don't think that there's ever going to be another, let's say Hitler. No, I don't think so. Personally, I don't know. I'm ninety-one years old now. I uh, I don't know much of the future anymore, what the future holds. But at the present, I I don't believe so because even right now, when I talk to these kids in high schools and stuff like that, and I tell my story, they're not Jewish. They they believe my story. They they wrote me a lot of letters, you know, thanking me for my presentation. They took it very seriously, you know. Told them it's not only that, but it's it's something that should not be in the future anymore.